Daniela, you may begin. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the centenary celebrations for economics at Wits University. My name is Daniela Casale. I'm a professor in the School of Economics and Finance, and I'll be helping to chair tonight's event. First of all, let me thank each and every one of you for joining us tonight. We've had the most remarkable response to tonight's event with well over 1,000 registrations. Indeed, if we were holding this event in person at WITS, we would have more than filled our great hall. We have joining us tonight a number of members, staff and students from within the school, from across the university, including members of our executive, we have with us tonight friends and colleagues from universities and institutions around South Africa and indeed across the globe. We have members of various government departments join us tonight, members of the media, including our media partner for tonight's event, The Conversation, and a wide array of people even from the private sector. So to each of you, welcome. A special word of welcome though must go to our guest speakers tonight. You will have seen from the invitation that our event has two main components. The first is a keynote address delivered by world-renowned economist, Professor Tomar Piketty. He'll be sharing with us tonight insights from his latest book titled, A Brief History of Equality. Given the theme of tonight's event, we're of course thrilled that Professor Piketty could join us this evening. The keynote address is going to then be followed by a panel discussion on economic policy making in the high inequality context. For this, we're honored to have join us a little later on this evening, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iweala, Director General of the World Trade Organization and the first African and first woman to hold this post in its 75 year history. She'll be joined this evening by three other esteemed members of the economics community in South Africa. Ms. Trudy Makaya, economic advisor to the South African president and a WITS alumnus, and professors Liberty Mkube and Kenneth Creamer, who are both members of our school, as well as members of the Presidential Economic Advisory Council. But before we move on to these exciting discussions, you're going to be hearing a brief video message from our Vice Chancellor, Prof. Zeblon Vilakazi. He couldn't be with us this evening, but he wanted to welcome our guest speakers himself. Following that, you'll be hearing from our Head of School, Professor Uma Kolamparambal, who will be sharing with you a very brief history, a promise very brief history of our school, and also a vision for the future. Over now, though, to our Vice Chancellor. Good evening. Welcome to this event themed 100 years of economics adverts, reflecting on the past, looking into the future. And this will consist of two parts. The first one will be a presentation by Professor Thomas Piketty, which will be chaired by Professor Evalodia on the brief history of equality. It will follow with a panel discussion with a very distinguished list of panelists that have agreed to grace us on this occasion today. This university is 100 years old and is linked to 100 years of this country's industrialization. Moreover, this city, arguably one of, one of the world's most unequal cities in a very unequal country, is an experiment upon which new thinking around economics can be framed. Winston Churchill said, in order to look into the future, you need to look back into the past. So therefore, as you reflect on the last 100 years of Feds, the centrality within this country's industrialization, its economic policy. And also, as you go forward in the next 100 years, what lessons have we learned of the pitfalls of industrialization in the last 100 years? With that, I'd like to once again thank the speaker, our uh, keynote address speaker, Professor Piketty, and members 
of the highly distinguished panel discussion. I look forward to hearing more about the outcomes of these deliberations and wish you well for the discussion that's about to ensue. Welcome to VETS virtually. Merci beaucoup. Je remercie de votre présentation en avance uh, virtual, Professor Piketty. Good evening, everyone. I'm Uma Kolamparambo, the head of School of Economics and Finance at Wits University. After that brief but inspiring message from Vice Chancellor Professor Zeblon Vilakasi, let me briefly introduce the whole School of Economics and Finance, or CEF, as we like to call ourselves. Today marks a momentous occasion for the school as we join with the university celebrations with this exciting star-studded event. While the discipline of economics at WITS has a long and illustrious history of over 100 years, the School of Economics and Finance in its current form is just over two years old. Prior to 2020, the divisions of economics and finance operated within a larger collective, the School of Economics and Business Sciences, which also included information systems and other streams of business science subjects. 2020, therefore, marked a new dawn for SEF with its independent identity focusing on economics and finance. Despite the establishment of SEF coinciding, unfortunately, with the COVID-19 pandemic and the turbulent time that followed it, SEF has established itself as a vibrant school with exciting new teaching programs and high quality research output. We are home to over 3,500 undergraduate and over 400 postgraduate students. We have a permanent staff, academic staff complement of over 49 and admin staff complement of over nine. In addition, we have many more visiting staff from the industry and the policy realm who have contributed to the teaching of our academic programs and to the intellectual life of the school. The economics division prides itself in standing apart from other schools in the country by offering both mainstream as well as more heterodox economics programs, both at the postgrad and undergrad levels. We are constantly striving to tailor our teaching programs and courses to meet the emerging challenges of the development context of the Global South and Africa in particular. The newly introduced master's program in environmental and energy economics in 2022 is a case in point. Since 2020, we have also introduced courses on health economics, gender economics, international finance in response to the policy challenges faced by South Africa in these areas. But perhaps one of the biggest challenges facing South Africa is economic inequality. We are therefore very pleased to be introducing in collaboration with the Southern Center of Inequality Studies at WITS, a new master's program in inequality studies in 2023. This would be first of its kind among South African universities. It is only appropriate then that the topic of the keynote speaker today is on the history of global equality. The admissions for this and the other programs offered by the school are now open and the details of which can be found on the CEF website. CEF has also embarked on a journey of internationalization. Some examples include our partnership in the Erasmus Mundus Epoch Plus Master's Program, a student and staff exchange program with UC Louvain, Belgium, being a PhD partner institutions in the African Economic Research Consortium, the Civis Project with La Sapienza Rome, and the Open Society University Network. We are also currently in active conversation with other institutions in the UK and Germany to set up joint international degrees. Providing student support 
has been a key focus area for the new school. We have made concerted effort in the last two years to raise funds for financially disadvantaged students to further their postgraduate studies. We are also working closely with industry and external partners to set up endowed chair positions to further our research agenda. In this regard, I'm most grateful for the support from PPS to set up the chair position in health economics, the first rank group towards a chair in FinTech, and the Derek Schreyer and Cecily Cameron, as well as Helen Sussman Trust for funding awards towards two prestigious chairs in development. As we strive towards collaborating on international funded research projects, we hope to develop an ecosystem that supports our research students better. Further information on the research initiatives of the school and the interesting work that is done by our staff are on the CEF website. And I hope that you will be motivated to take a look at it. With that brief introduction to the School of Economics and Finance, let me not further stand between you and the exciting guests that we have lined up this evening. I now hand over to Daniela for the rest of the proceedings. Thank you, Uma, for that description of our school. We thought it would be a good idea to introduce you to as many of our members of staff and the executive tonight as possible. So I'm also going to be handing the chair over to Professor Imran Velodia for the keynote session. Imran wears a number of hats tonight. He is our Pro Vice Chancellor for Climate, Sustainability and Inequality at WITS, a new but very important portfolio. He's also the Director for the Southern Centre for Inequality Studies at WITS. He was our former Dean, in fact, and therefore instrumental in supporting our school to become a standalone, fully fledged school at the university. He's an economist by training, and he's also a member of the Presidential Economic Advisory Council. So Imran, I'll hand over to you now to introduce Professor Pichetti. Great, um, it's, my, it's my great pleasure to be, um, to kind of play a small part in the proceedings tonight and to chair this, uh, uh, this uh, part of the event. Um, I'd like to start by congratulating uh, by uh, 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 by uh, kind of saying how how pleased I am that that we've now been teaching economics at WITS for a hundred years, um, and to congratulate the school on the uh, 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 kind of achievement of this huge landmark. I think it's appropriate then uh, that we. We start with a a uh, with a dis discussion um, on the most important issue of, of facing our economy and kind of indeed the world, and that we can be addressed um, on that uh, uh, topic by Professor uh, uh, Piketty, who I think is is without uh, doubt the most prominent uh, kind of thinker on issues of inequality. Um, his work on the uh, uh, kind of relationship between economic development um, and the distribution of income and wealth, I think, um, has really uh, put this issue at the center of our uh, 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 policy debate. Uh, professor uh, uh, Pickett is a professor at EHAS um, and at the uh, 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 Paris School of Economics. Uh, he's the, uh, the co-director of the World Inequality Lab and he has uh, 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 published some of the most important uh, 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 pieces in recent times um, on the the uh, the the uh, kind of issues of inequality, both on how we measure it, but also much more on what are the driving forces that are uh, 
there are increasing levels of inequality around the world and what are the ways in which we can deal with it. Uh, Professor uh, Pickett is going to talk for about 30, uh, 30 minutes. He unfortunately has, um, has to leave us at six. With that constraint, we'd like to make this as interactive as we can. So please feel free to, uh, uh, to post any questions in the Q&A slot. Um, and we'll try to put those questions to Prof. Uh, uh, Piketty. With that, let me then pass it on to to uh, uh, to, uh, to Thomas and come ask him to address us. Thanks a lot, Iman. Thanks a lot, uh, everybody, for uh, for making this possible. So let me try to share my screen and uh, uh, make sure that you can see uh, my slides. Uh, uh, um, um, yes, it's all in order. Come on, we, yeah. we can see your slide. Okay, that's great. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about this uh, this new book, A Brief History of Equality, which I should stress uh, is an optimistic book. So this is a book, you know, I think we need optimistic message these days, which is, you know, can seem a bit paradoxical. But, you know, in this book, I try to stress the fact that you know, in the long run, despite, you know, everything we know about rising inequality uh, here and there, you know, we have made collectively progress, you know, in many countries and to some extent at the global level uh, in, in the past century or even in the past two centuries. And, and we can learn a lot from this progress in order to, to continue in this direction in the long run. So I'm going to, to summarize some of the arguments that are, uh, that are being presented in more details in my, in my book, A Brief History of Equality. But first, you know, I'm going to show you a couple of results coming from the World Inequality Report 2022, which we just published at the World Inequality Lab a couple of months ago, in order, you know, to set the scene about the, sort of the big picture uh, about uh, world inequality and what we know and wh what we don't know. So this World Inequality Report, you know, is a report that we publish every uh, four years. So we had a World Inequality Report in 2018, and this World Inequality Report 2022 uh, was just published. This is based on, the, so you can get all the material online. Uh, uh, you can also see online you know, the, the World Inequality Database, which is this database uh, which we you know, constantly update, you know, almost every week there is some new data from various countries all over the world. And with this World Inequality Report, we sort of uh, uh, every four years try to summarize, you know, what what have been our main findings over the past uh, four years. So in, in this uh, World Inequality Database, we started with inequality of income, then moved to inequality of wealth, and, and one of the main novelties in the World Inequality Report 2022 is that we've started to move toward uh, gender inequality and also inequality in carbon emission and environmental inequality. So I'm going to give you very quickly you know, a snapshot of some of our main findings about uh, uh, inequality of income, inequality of wealth, gender, and environmental inequality. So sorry, you know, this is going to be pretty fast, but you know, you can find all the detailed data online. So let me start with income inequality with a simple indicator, which is a share of total income going to the top 10% of the population. So let's let, let's be clear about the orders of magnitude. You know, if if we had complete equality, the top 10% of the population should get. 10% of total income. If we had complete inequality, uh, the top 10% should get 100% of total income. Now, in practice, of course, we are always between 10 and 100%. But what I want to stress is that there is actually a lot of variation at the global level and also at the historical level. So first, at the global level, if we look, so this is a snapshot for today, you know, 2021 or, you know, the whatever the latest data year was available the top 10% income share goes from about 20, 25% that will be, you know, in Nordic Europe, in Norway, to 60, 70% that will be in Latin America or actually in South Africa, which according to this indicator with the 67% going to the top 10% will be 
at the top of the world in terms of inequality. Now, if we if we try to understand, you know, wh where does inequality come from, you know, just looking at this map, you can see that you know there's a variety of factors that push toward uh, extreme inequality. You know, certainly the legacy of the apartheid system in the case of, of South Africa, the legacy of uh, uh, slavery, racial inequality, you know, in the, in the, in the case of Brazil. The, also, the, if you look at the Middle East, uh, uh, you know, you will have to look at how uh, uh, oil and, and, you know, the accumulation of financial wealth coming from oil uh, production, you know, contribute to very high inequality. India, you would have to look to the specific historical legacy of the colonial system in India and the caste system in India. So so, you know, there's a variety of factors, but clearly, you know, historical legacy is, is very important and, and you have this, you know, enormous variation across countries. Uh, now, this is true for the top 10%. Uh, this is also true, you know, and that's maybe even more important if you look at the bottom 50%. So, you know, this is the same map, but now with the share going to the bottom 50% of the population. Um, so, again, you know, if we had complete equality, the bottom 50% should have 50% of total income. And if we had complete inequality, they should have 0%. So in practice, it's always between 0 and 50. Now, in practice, it goes from 5% or a little more than 5% again in South Africa to 20, 25%. Uh, of total income uh, uh, for the bottom 50% in a country like Sweden or Norway. Now, you know, of course, you have inequality everywhere, you know, including in, in, uh, in, in Northern Europe or in Europe in, in general. But you can see that, you know, if you have if you are 50% of the population and you are and you have 25% of total income, you know, it means that on average, the average income of the bottom 50% is about half of the average income of the entire population. So, you know, of course you are poorer than average, but you are not, you know, hugely poorer than average. Whereas if you have only 5% of total income, like in, uh, like in South Africa, it means that on average, uh, your income is, is only 10% of the average income of the, of the, of the total population. So the, the gap is much bigger between the bottom and, and, the, and the, rest of the, so the rest of society. So this gives you an, an order of magnitude. You can also see that, you know, what this means is that uh, you, when, you, when you look at economic welfare and economic development across countries, you really want to look at the distribution. That, you know, it shows that the distribution really matters a lot. If you only look at total GDP or GDP per capita or national income per capita, you can miss a lot because as you can see, you know, the share going to the bottom 50% can vary uh, uh, from a factor of one to five, you know, from 5% to 25% of total income, which means that for the same GDP per capita or same average income, the average income of the bottom 50% can actually vary from a factor of one to five, you know, which makes an enormous difference in terms of global poverty and in terms of opportunities for the children of the bottom 50% and, you know, in terms of basic uh, uh, living conditions. So, you know, that clearly shows that we need to look at the distribution and not only at the averages. The other interesting lesson, as I was saying earlier, is that you have enormous historical variation. So if we look and, you know, at the situation today, you can see that the richest countries in the world, you know, in particular in Europe, but also in, in to, to a lesser extent in the US and in Japan, tend to be you know, less unequal than countries in the, in the global south. Now, what's interesting is that it's not always been like that. You know, so the countries in the, in the north you know, used to be very unequal. They have become more equal over time, in particular over the course of the 20th century. And in fact, this has been a very important step in the process of development and growth. And so when people say, uh, you know, that poor countries, you know, should wait uh, until they become rich before they can redistribute anything, you know, I think it's, it's very, very, you know, largely wrong in the sense that, you know, what happened in the, in the West and in the North is that the, the process of, of, you know, reducing inequality, uh, which sometimes happens through enormous shocks, you know, World War I, World War II, and major political transformation, uh, was uh, uh, actually 
very strongly interrelated with the process of growth and development, with in particular with the huge uh, post-war post -war, war II uh, growth experience. And so if you look at Europe, you know, today you, you, you have uh, the top 10% share, which is about 30, 35%. Uh, but if you look one century ago, you know, before 1914, in fact, all countries in Europe uh, you, you know, France, Germany, Britain, but also countries like Sweden today, which looks very egalitarian, were actually very unequal. So it was not it was not quite South Africa, but it was not very different from Brazil. So, you know, the, the, the top 10% income share uh, in Europe in, in before 1914 was, you know, between 50, 55, 60%, and the bottom 50% income share was around 10%. So it was not quite as unequal as South Africa, but, you know, not so different from Latin America. And so, it, you know, there's no historical deterministic reason, you know, cultural or civilizational or whatever, why, you know, a given country should be equal or unequal. You know, in the end, it depends on political choices, political change, uh, transformation through a change in institutions and, and policy. And, you know, I, you know, that's a very important discussion, of course, in, in South Africa. You know, I know that, you know, today there, there is a, a lot of discussion in South Africa about the possible introduction of a, of a wealth tax, of a, a universal basic income scheme. And, you know, I think these are very important policy tools that can help go in the direction in, in a, of more equality. So this was about inequality of income. Now, let me move to inequality of wealth. So I just mentioned the you know, possibility of a progressive wealth tax in South Africa. You know, I, th I think what's important here to remember is that inequality of wealth is always a lot larger than inequality of income. So if you look here on this slide, you know, we have, uh, so this comes from the World Inequality Report 2022. So the bottom line is that, you know, the concentration of wealth is, is pretty huge pretty much everywhere. So, you know, including in, in Europe. So if you look here in Europe, you know, you have the uh, top 10% share is 58%, the, the bottom 50% uh, share is 4%. Okay, this is better than in, in uh, Latin America or in Sub-Saharan Africa, where it's only one or 2% for the bottom 50%. But, you know, it's still very small, you know, 4% of total wealth for the bottom 50%. So, you know, there's been a reduction of wealth inequality in the long run in, in uh, rich countries uh, uh, in Europe and North America with the development of, of what you can call a sort of wealth middle class, you know, which I define as the middle 40%, which are in between the bottom 50 and the top 10. But, uh, you know, this, this movement toward more equality in the distribution of wealth has been much more limited than for the distribution of income. And in particular, uh, you know, the bottom 50% basically owns almost no wealth, uh, you know, everywhere. You know, there's no country where, you know, the share going to the bottom 50% is larger than 5 or at most 10%, uh, including in, in Northern Europe. Uh, so, you know, it's particularly unequal in a country like South Africa, where it's basically 0% or 1% or, or even negative when you take all the people with negative wealth and debt for the bottom 50%. But, you know, it's, there's no country in the world which has really moved toward, you know, more inclusive distribution of wealth, including the bottom 50%. And, and so, you know, it's a big question of how do we get to make more progress in the long run for the distribution of wealth. And, you know, I, I have a discussion in my book, in my brief history of equality, where basically I argue that, you know, standard policy based on income redistribution, including a basic income, unemployment insurance, pension, family benefits are, of course, very uh, important, but they are probably not uh, sufficient. And if you want to redistribute wealth itself, well, you have to have direct measures to redistribute wealth, uh, you know, this can include historically land reform, this includes, this can also include minimum inheritance um, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, all children at age 25. So, you know, if you, I'm not saying that's going to be simple, you know, there's going to be a lot of resistance to that. Uh, you know, there was also a lot of resistance historically to the development of income-based redistribution, and there is still a lot to do in terms of income-based redistribution. Wealth-based redistribution will take probably even more time and even more, uh, you know, uh, more difficult political battles. I'm just saying, you know, if we want to make progress in terms of wealth redistribution, we will have to, to, to get there at, at some point. So I started with 
inequality of income. I've just talked a little more about inequality of wealth. Let me move to, uh, you know, gender inequality, which is, you know, of course, uh, uh, you know, very important and has attracted a lot more attention recently than it has uh, historically. What I want to stress here, so this is a simple indicator of gender inequality, which we have developed in the World Inequality Report 2022, uh, is that, in fact, if you look at this indicator, which is a share of women in total labor income, you know, including wage income, self-employment income. In fact, we are quite far from gender parity, you know, pretty much everywhere. So if you look in, in, in Western Europe, North America, you know, we used to be a little over 30% uh, going to women. Now we are 35, 38%. You know, this is, this is uh, going in the right direction. But you know, we are still very far from 50%. You know, if you, if you look at time use survey, you know, including domestic labor, uh, the share of labor time supplied by women is always at least 50%, or actually more than 50% if you include all household labor. Uh, so, you know, you could think that uh, a reasonable objective in terms of, of, uh, of income distribution would be at least, you know, 50% for, uh, for, for women. And, you know, we are quite far. There, there are region in the world, you know, including uh, in particular the Middle East and North Africa, where it's extremely small. Uh, uh, also, you know, in, 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 in Western Europe and the US, it used to be also very small, you know, uh, uh, you know as small as 20%, 25% if you go back to 1960, 1970. So, you know, things again can change. You can see countries in the world like China, where it's actually going down, which is due to the fact that uh, the, the rise of very top wages actually increase the share of total wage going to uh, uh, men, especially in a context like China, where the, the top wages were not very high to begin with uh, in 1990, and, and uh, gender equality was relatively more advanced in communist countries than in other parts of the, of the, of the world. Let me move finally to, to the, the, you know, the last uh, important novelty of the World Inequality Report 2022, which is about the distribution of uh, carbon emission across the world. So, you know, of course, we all know about the huge inequality between countries in terms of carbon emission. You know, we know that you know, countries in the global north are responsible for you know, the vast majority of historical carbon emission, and you know, the countries that are going to suffer the most uh, from this are obviously uh, in, the, in the south. What I want to stress here is that within the north and within the south, there's also enormous inequality in terms of carbon emission. So, you know, if you look, uh, uh, you know, if you look in, in Europe or North America, you take Europe, you know, the bottom 50% has uh, an average carbon emission of about five tons per capita. So this includes, you know, the carbon content of all imported goods. So this is not only about domestic production, it's also about uh, import, import uh, taking into account import and exports. So, you know, if you look at the bottom 50% in Europe, right now, you know, five tons per capita, okay, this should be reduced, this should go toward four, three, or two tons in the coming decades. But, you know, it's not completely out of line with the, the objective for 2050. Whereas if you look at the top 10%, you know, they have 29 tons, uh, 73 tons in North America. Uh, if you look at the top 1%, you know, you would have uh, uh, you know, 70 tons in, in Europe and, uh, you know, 200 uh, tons in, in, in North America. And, you know, the bottom line is that if we want to be serious about reducing carbon emission, you know, I, I, you know, I think this will have to come with a drastic reduction in economic inequality. Because if you, you know, if you tell people in the bottom 50%, okay, we are going to have a huge uh, carbon tax or a huge increase in energy prices so that everybody has to reduce their carbon emission in, in a proportional manner, more or less, you know, I think people in the bottom 50% will simply never accept this, you know, and you will have a gigantic uh, uh, protest movement or yellow vest movement like what we had in France a couple of years ago all around the world, because, you know, people in the bottom group um, uh, will, will tell you, well, look, okay, maybe we can make an effort, but first, you know, you have to reduce the carbon emission of people at the, at the, at the top, which will come if we have enormous reduction in income and wealth inequality, and to some extent gender inequality, uh, but will also require some specific 
policy tools and you know probably uh, we will need to develop some something like a progressive carbon tax so that you don't treat in the same manner you know people who emit two or three or four tons and people who emit uh, uh, 30 tons or 100 uh, tons uh, so you know I'm, I'm not saying this is easy but you know again you know developing progressive income tax at the beginning of the 20th century was also difficult and many people at the time you know many conservative economists or you know conservative interest group uh, said it was impossible well in the end it was possible and and you know I think Today, we have sort of similar, well, different new challenges, but similar challenges in that, at a general level. And, and I think we have to go through a similar uh, process. So, you know, I, I have already started to, to mention some of the uh, conclusions that I push in my, in my book, A Brief History of Equality. Let, let me, let me uh, summarize a little more what, you know, what I, what I show in this book. Well, first, you know, the, the, I think the good thing about this book is that it's, uh, it's relatively brief and short. You know, it's like 250 pages or something like this. So this can be read in a weekend. Uh, uh, as compared to you know these three other books which I wrote in, uh, in the past 20 years, which uh, you know each of them is 1,000 page long, so you know please don't read them unless you know you have a lot of time to devote to this topic. But if you don't have a lot of time, and you know everybody has a lot of things to do, and uh, you, uh, everybody has his own uh, uh, priorities, you, I recommend that you read this one, which is much shorter, and I think gets at the most important conclusion. Now it's much shorter, but I, you know. I want to show you a little bit the structure of the argument. You have uh, 10 chapters in the book. I, you know, I start with this movement toward more equality of income and wealth, which I already uh, uh, mentioned. There's a long sequence on you know, the heritage of slavery, colonialism, the question of reparation. For instance, you know, if we think of reparations that should be paid by a country like France to a country like Haiti, which, as you may know, had to pay uh, you know, huge uh, tribute to France, you know, between 1825 and the 1950s, so during almost one century and a half in order to uh, compensate uh, French uh, slave owners for their loss of property following the independence of Haiti. So you know, this is just one example of a, of a clear case, I think, for reparation. Uh, you know, I'm not saying the issue of reparation in general is an easy one, but I think it's just, it's not acceptable to, to, to refuse the discussion. You know, I think we, we have to confront this discussion, uh, in particular in a case like Haiti, but you know, there are other cases where the solution has to come, uh, not necessarily through direct reparation, but at least through a transformation of the, of the global economic system and in particular the global tax system uh, in, a, in, a, in a direction that is more favorable to countries in the South. And so this is a, a, a discussion that I have, uh, you know, at the end of the book, in particular uh, in the chapter exiting neocolonialism and chapter 10 toward a new model of democratic uh, socialism, where I stress the fact that, you know, when we talk about, you know, minimum tax on multinationals or, you know, taxing uh, global billionaires, you know, what's very, you know, it's good that we have made a little progress discussing about the minimum tax on corporations, multinational corporations in recent years. The big problem in my view is that, you know, this was mostly uh, a game, you know, within the North. So basically, Northern countries, you know, tried to design ways in order to split between themselves some of the tax base that was located in tax havens and very little went to the, to the global South, you know, to, countries like, like uh, South Africa or Brazil or India or, or Nigeria, or whatever. So I think it's very important, you know, to put on the table and the agenda for future discussion, a system where, uh, you know, every country in the world uh, receives at least a share of uh, uh, tax revenues uh, coming from the most uh, uh, prosperous and powerful economic actors of the world, including multinational corporation, global billionaire, uh, uh, in proportion to the population of each country. And, and, you know, I think there are several reasons for that. You know, one is that there is, a, uh, you know, there should be a minimum right for development for every human being in terms of access to education, health, and the chance of, you know, development in general. And, and the other reason is that, uh, uh, you know, there will be no rich country today without uh, uh, poor countries. And, you know, since industrial revolution, the development 
uh, of rich countries, you know, happens through a system of international uh, division of labor, uh, uh, exploitation at the world level of natural resources, also exploitation of labor at the world level, you know, sometimes in a very uh, brutal uh, manner. And, you know, it's, it's very, uh, it will be a, a huge hypocrisy, uh, you know, for, for, the, for the most powerful uh, countries and economic actors of the world today to say, well, you know, uh, the, we have nothing to do with poor countries. This is not our responsibility. Uh, whereas, you know, the entire process of economic development happen through this, uh, this global uh, uh, economic uh, system. And, you know, of course, there is an enormous responsibility toward in terms of global warming uh, from the north, which I referred to earlier. So I, I don't want to be too long because I want to keep time for questions. Let me simply say, you know, regarding wealth distribution in the long run, that, you know, there has been minimum, pro, you know, limited progress uh, uh, in the West in the long run. So here I give you the historical evolution for a country like France. You know, you can see that the, the share of total wealth going to the top 10 percent, you know, declined between World War I, you know, between 1914 and 1980, but it's still very high today. And in particular, you know, the bottom 50 percent, as I was saying earlier, uh, owns, uh, you know, about 5% of total wealth in a country like France today. So, you know, it's a bit better than in the 19th century where it was 1% or 2% like uh, Latin America or, or Sub-Saharan Africa today. But, you know, it's, it's not, it's still very, 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 very small. And it's not only France, you know, it's, it's also all European countries. So, you know, where very unequal until World War I. So you can see here France, Britain, Sweden, where basically the top 10% had 80, 90% of total wealth until World War I. There's been some redistribution between, say, 1913 and today. So you can see, you know, the, the middle 40%, you know, the people in between the bottom 50% and the top 10 that have made progress. But for the bottom 50%, there's been very little progress. And, you know, in recent decades, it has even started to reverse a little bit, uh, particularly uh, in, in the United States. So uh, how do we make progress in the right direction? Well, historically, what has been pretty successful is, you know, the rise of the welfare state, which I prefer to call the social state in, in Europe and to a lesser extent in, in North America and, and, uh, and, and Japan. You know, it's, uh, you know, before World War I, total social spending were very small, you know, less than 1% uh, of national income. And for uh, education, it was less than 0.5% of national income in all European countries before World War I. And this is this enormous you know, increase in educational investment and, and social distribution in general, which came together with, with development and, and growth and, and made a big difference. The invention of progressive taxation also, I will argue, was an enormous success historically. So, you know, this is a difficult discussion sometimes to have, but I, I really want you to, to have in mind that in a country like the United States, uh, the top income tax rate uh, was as large as 82% on average between 1930 and 1980. Uh, and, you know, this didn't kill American capitalism, otherwise we would have noticed it. And in fact, if anything, this was a period of maximum prosperity, uh, maximum economic growth uh, in the United States, uh, in particular in the 1950-1980 period. Why is it so? Well, because you don't need income gaps of 1 to 100 or 1 to 200 to develop. And you know, I'm not saying you want complete equality. Maybe you need income gap of 1 to 5, 1 to 10, 1 to 20. I actually think that 1 to 5, 1 to 10 is is sufficient, you know, on the basis of the comparative historical evidence I have. But in any case, you know, one to one hundred, one to two hundred or more, you know, my, my, if you put together the historical evidence we have, when this was reduced drastically in the twentieth century, you know, this did not reduce growth at all. In fact, if you look, so you know, this is a short history of growth and progressive taxation in the United States. So you can see that you know when when the progressive taxation increased a lot and you know the, the, the top income tax rate between 1950 and 1990 was over 70%, you know, the growth rate was was pretty much the same 
than what it was before, you know, between 1910 and 1950 or 1870, 1910, or it was even a bit better. Uh, and And the opposite, you know, in recent decades, you know, the, the after the Reagan decade of the 1980s, you know, the, the top income tax rate was reduced, divided by two. This was supposed to boost growth, to boost innovation. So, you know, the official economic discourse were, was, okay, maybe you're going to have more inequality, but, uh, you know, in the end, you will have so much more growth the pie will grow so fast that in the end, you will have more inequality with a growing pie, so everybody will benefit from it, except that the growth rate was actually divided by two. You know, you can see the growth rate went from 2.2 to 1.1% in per capita national income terms. Uh, uh, now, I'm, you know, I'm not saying the growth rate was divided by two because the top income tax rate was divided by two. I think the, the main explanation is probably the stagnation of educational investment uh, over this period. And, and uh, also the fact that the U.S. was so uh, prosperous uh, in the middle of the 20th century and that the income gap with Europe and the rest of the world was so big at the time was because of the enormous educational advance of the U.S. So to summarize you know, the true source of economic prosperity historically is much more education than inequality. And actually it is education and a certain level of equality in education. And this is what made uh, the US so rich in the 1950s, 1960s, you know, this was a time when in the 1950s, you had 90% of a cohort going to high school in the US. At the same time, it was only 20 or 30% in Germany or France and, and Japan. And you have to wait until the 1980s, 1990s to have a catch up between educational level between Western Europe and the US. And you have also the catch up in productivity. So you know, I think there, are, there is a very solid uh, empirical and historical ground showing that uh, you know, what matters for prosperity is, is more you know, social investment, in particular investment in education with, with, um, with a certain level of equality in, in education uh, rather than you know, going always for, for more and more uh, inequality. So how do we get further in the future in this direction? I've already talked about the redistribution of inheritance. So you know, this is just an example where you would have In this example, you have a minimum inheritance for everybody at age 25, which will be uh, 120,000 euros. So this is in the European context. This will be the equivalent of about 60% of average wealth, which is about 200,000 euros per adult in, in Europe right now. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying this will be easy. This will take enormous uh, uh, political battle. But if you, know, if you don't do something like this, you know, probably the bottom 50% share in total wealth will remain. Uh, extremely small uh, in the in the in the future. You know the idea that we should just wait for growth and market competition to spread the wealth. You know is perfectly fine uh, from a purely theoretical level. But if you look at history, you know we've had growth and the industrial revolution for two centuries, and you know the share of the bottom 50% in total wealth is still less than 5% in every country for which we have uh, data. So you know we are going to wait for a very long time if we just wait for growth and market competition to do the job. So, you know, I think we have to get to something more uh, substantial. Uh, you know, I think, you know, the, the, we should also think, you know, in the view of what I call participatory socialism and power sharing within the company, which I push in my, in my book. I stress also that we should go even further you know, in the direction of what is called co-determination or co-management in the context of Germany and Sweden, where uh, workers representative uh, in Germany and Sweden have up to 50% of voting rights in the board of large companies. I think we should go even further in this direction. So here, you know, this graph, I cannot get into the details, but there's a specific proposal proposing to extend this system to all companies, large and small, and to put a cap on how much uh, voting right a single shareholder can have in a large uh, company. Uh, say, you know, not more than 10% or 5% of voting right in a company of more than 100 workers for a single shareholder. And, you know, the general idea is that the sharing of power in companies, uh, uh, which we've seen historically in, in countries like Germany and Sweden, you know, in fact, has, has been quite good from an economic viewpoint in the long run, because this has helped to involve workers in the long run strategy 
and the company and you know workers are investors in labor you know they invest their labor they invest their skills and you know they have an interest in the long run uh, uh, evolution of their company which is sometimes much more uh, consistent than the, the short run investors who come and leave the company uh, for purely uh, short term financial interest in a, in a number of of cases there will be a lot more to say in particular about you know, getting serious uh, uh, on a, a real uh, equality of education. I mean, here you have a graph on percentile of parental income and rate of access to higher education in the US where you can see, you know, the enormous inequality in access to higher education and also the enormous hypocrisy that we have around this topic. You know, everybody claims to be in favor of equal opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at what we have, you know, the world in which we live is, is quite uh, quite different. This is true in the US with very high tuition fees. This is also true in France where you have a public education system for the most part, but you have actually more public investment for students who go to elite school, you know, called Grande Ecole in the French context, than for students who leave the school system at age 18. So in effect, the public educational investment will tend to reinforce uh, uh, initial family inequality. So again, if you take a long run historical perspective, and you know, I'm going to, to stop there, uh, uh, we've made some progress. So you know, if you look at the concentration of educational investment in historical perspective, uh, France in 2020, although it is still very unequal, looks less unequal than France in 1910, where we had a very elitist much more elitist educational system. And it looks less unequal than a colonial setting like uh, here I take Algeria 1950, where basically the children of the colonial settlers, about 10% of the population. And you know, Algeria in some ways has, you know, can be compared to South Africa. I mean, it's a different context, but you have in, in both cases a white uh, minority of you know, 10 to 20% of the population, which historically received most of the educational investment. You know, 80% for the children of the white settlers in the Algerian context in 1950. And you know, I assume it will be pretty close in, in South Africa at the same time. Uh, and of course, this, you know, this kind of enormous inequality in educational resources has a long-standing effect. Uh, so as compared to this situation, you know, of course, we have made progress, but you know, this progress are, are still insufficient. And we have to be more serious about real access to educational resources. And, and you know, finally, we have to be more serious about the, what I call you know, the long exit from colonialism. I mean, this is the final slide I want to show you. Uh, you, know, you have here you have a measure of the income gaps between rich countries and poor countries. So I look at the top 10% of the world population living in the richest countries, and I divide their average income by the average income of the bottom 50% of the world population living in the poorest countries. You can see that you know, after the beginning of decolonization and you know, also the end of apartheid in South Africa, there has been a, 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 a beginning of a decline in, in income gap between countries, but we are still at very high level, basically comparable to what we have in 1900, 1910, uh, and, and higher than what we had at the beginning of the industrial period and of modern uh, colonization. And, and so if we want to move further, you know, I, as I said before, I think it will, it will take not only domestic uh, uh, policy reform to have more redistribution, but also international uh, uh, economic reform, in particular regarding the taxation system at the global level, with a bigger share for countries in the in the south from the you know, tax revenue coming from the most prosperous world economic actors. Let me stop there. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention, and you know, of course, I'd be very happy to to answer questions. Thanks a lot for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, 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 Piketty, I, 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 I know that you have to leave it at six, but I'm going to ask if we could at least put two, uh, could we put two questions to you? Okay. Um, and, and take up your time. So the first one, I'm, I'm kind of summarizing from, 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 uh, from the Q&As. The, the first one relates to the uh, 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 policy questions in South Africa. There's a 
a, 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 a number of, of kind of questions about your thoughts on kind of ideas of a, a, a basic income grant in South Africa. The counter to that view would be to say that 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 kind of South Africa is 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 stuck with with kind of high levels of inequality, but also quite kind of serious uh, kind of challenges on on the uh, fiscal side, and that any extension of what you've called the social state would hit up. Um, Kind of against this uh, fiscal challenge. So, what are your thoughts on kind of how to deal with inequality in countries where there there might be a fiscal challenge to to confront? That's the first question. The kind of second questions on the international dimensions of inequality and the points that you've made about uh, about a, a kind of international taxation compensation scheme that would that would would kind of operate kind of between uh, 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 well uh, um, among all kind of, uh, uh, countries of the world which would allow compensation to happen from uh, countries in in the north that have kind of really produced a large part of the climate problem if you could just give us some of your ideas on how um, on how such a compensation scheme might work in might work in practice okay uh, so regarding the first question you know on south africa you know that's uh, you know of course a very important and, and difficult question L let me simply say this the what you know if you look at, at the international and historical level usually uh, you have a uh, sort of a joint movement toward more uh, redistribution of uh, you know education, health, uh, income transfer, and also more equality in pre-tax inequality. So you know if you look at European countries, which I was referring to earlier, uh, they they also you know it's not only redistribution which made them more equal; it's also primary inequality which has become smaller over time thanks to you know investment in education but also thanks to transformation of the distribution of bargaining power for workers and you know other mechanism which, I, which I made this happen now in south africa you actually don't see this happening and that's really what's probably the most depressing feature of, of uh, uh, south africa which is that if you look at pre-tax income you know primary income the share of total income going to the bottom 50 percent is really incredibly small and you know it, 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 it didn't make much progress since the end of apartheid and so you have ex post redistribution coming which is of course very important and you know i'm certainly not saying this should be reduced you know this should be increased and you know i am in favor of universal basic income but we really need to think hard and strong as to why so little progress has been made uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, primary income going to the bottom 50%. And I think it would be a big mistake to say oh, that's because we had too much redistribution because you know in other parts of the world, more redistribution to the bottom 50% also came with improvement in the share of primary income going to the bottom 50%. So why didn't it happen in South Africa? You know, probably because South Africa, of course, has a starting point in terms of territorial inequality, territorial segregation, primary inequality, which is completely uh, uh, unheard of, uh, uh, you know, at, at world level. And so probably there's a need for more sort of desegregation policy in terms of, uh, you know, social mixing, in terms of uh, housing, transportation system, uh, 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 you know, bargaining power. So, you know, the redistribution of wealth, I think, you know, in South Africa, you know, will be, you know, and, you know, I know it's complicated, you know, it's complicated everywhere, but, but, you know, I think if you don't redistribute primary assets themselves, you know, including wealth and bargaining power and, and residential, probably it's going to be difficult to change really this extreme concentration of primary income that we have in, in, in South Africa. So that's a, a very difficult challenge, but, but uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I think that 
you know, that's, that's a real question. You know, in the long run, if we keep with this uh, uh, bottom 50% income share in primary income of, you know, 5% of less, or, you know, according to some measure, if you take into account family size, which was not done in the data, I've shown you it's actually even less than 5%, you know, maybe it's 4 or 3%, you know, Amory Guetin and other researchers uh, uh, also in South Africa, you know, have worked on this. And, and you know, are we going to stay there? What's the target for 2030, 2040, 2050? You know, I, I think that should be the center of the discussion. Now, regarding international tax reform, you know, what I have in mind is that, you know, I, I think what would be important is if countries in the South, so, you know, I make some specific proposal in my book, but, you know, I think in the end, what matters is not so much what someone like me say in the book, but really what governments uh, and, you know, political parties and uh, trade union and social actors in the South uh, and in the North push. And I think it would be very useful if countries in the South could push for an agenda where, you know, even if they don't get it right away, they formulate explicitly with respect to the North uh, a different agenda. So for instance, you know, there was a discussion at the OECD level about what should be the formula to distribute, you know, multinational profits, uh, you know, between the different countries. You know, should it be uh, uh, in proportion to uh, the sales made in the various countries? Should it be in proportion to the payroll in the various countries, to the uh, capital investment in the various countries? I think at some point, uh, you know, we'll have to use population in one way or another. So I know it's a complete uh, change in perspective, but, you know, when you start using the payroll, uh, some People, you know, in the OECD discussion, you know, started to say, well, look, uh, uh, payroll is complicated because you have all the subcontractors. Uh, so what's going to be the average wage that you use for subcontractors? So should we use, you know, the number of workers, some estimate about the number of workers paid by the multinational and by the subcontractors? You know, at some point, you're getting close to a sort of population criterion. And I think at some point, we'll have to get a population criterion. You know, I'm not saying this will apply right away. I'm not saying this will apply to 100% of you know, the tax revenue coming from, from a, a multinational corporation or top wealth holders. But you know, if this applied only to a fraction of this tax revenue, this will already make a huge difference, at least, you know, maybe not for South Africa, but for the really about the poorest country in the world, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the Sahel or in, or in South Asia, you know, this will make a big difference, even if it's, if it's only about a very small fraction of this tax revenue. And so I think, you know, the, 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 it's important that there is a coalition in the world, you know, this can include, uh, uh, you know, various uh, uh, actors from civil society, you know, like uh, myself, but, you know, I think what's very important is to have the, the countries and the government of the countries in the South that are uh, involved. And, you know, they should put enough pressure on the countries in the North. You know, at some point, countries in the North uh, will have to accept major change because, you know, if they don't, uh, you know, I think, you know, one possibility for to accelerate political change is that, you know, countries like China, you know, will uh, will propose something else, you know, will propose some development uh, uh, plan for uh, to a number of countries in the South. And, uh, and, you know, with the geopolitical situation with China, Russia, Europe, Ukraine, US, you know, I think at some point countries in the North will have to move. That's going to be difficult, you know, it will maybe not happen in a very quiet uh, and peaceful manner, but you know, what could accelerate the process also, I think if, if countries in the South will contribute to put on the agenda some, some you know, very specific ambitious proposal, you know, with different scenario, and then, you know, maybe you don't get the most you ask for right away, but, you know, in the end, uh, I, you know, I think we'll have to, uh, we'll have to move in this, uh, in this direction. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh... for sharing your 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 kind of thoughts with us today um i know that you have an an, an another commitment at 6 p.m and we've yeah. we've kind of already gone beyond yeah, i'm that. afraid i have to run i'm sorry so thank you so much we look forward thanks to lot, thanks, that lot, Iman. thanks everybody and i hope to see you soon again in south africa in the not too distant uh, future so bye-bye bye-bye everybody bye -bye. With
with that then let me pass the chair on uh, uh, back on uh, back on to, uh, to uh, uh, back on to uh, 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 Daniela for the rest of the proceedings. Thank you, Imran. Um, and obviously, thank you to Prof. Paketi for his fascinating address. I wish we'd had more time together. But for now, we need to move on to the second part of tonight's event, which is our panel discussion on economic policy making in the high inequality context. So in a sense, we're going to be continuing with the discussion just in another form. To moderate this event, um, we're happy to have another one of our own join tonight, Professor Dory po Dorit Posel. Um, Dory, as we know her, is a distinguished professor in the School of Economics and Finance, and she holds the prestigious Helen Sussman Chair in Economic Development. So I'm handing over to Dory now to introduce our four panelists. Thank you very much, Daniela, and good evening all. We have four very illustrious people on our panel this evening. I could probably take at least 20 minutes to talk about what they have accomplished thus far, but I have been allocated at most five minutes, so I must be relatively brief. The first person on our panel is Dr. Ngozi Rokonjo Wella. Dr. Ngozi is the current Director General of the World Trade Organization, or the WTO. And as Daniela mentioned, she is the first woman and also the first African to hold the position in the 75-year history of the WTO. Dr. Ngozi was also Nigeria's first female and longest serving finance minister, serving two terms, as well as the first female foreign minister in Nigeria. Dr. Ngozi also spent a 25-year career at the World Bank and amongst her many other positions and achievements, which are just far too numerous to live this evening, Dr. Ngozi was one of the founders of the COVAX facility designed to get affordable vaccines to low and low middle income countries. In 2021, for the second time in her career, Dr. Ngozi was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World, and she featured on its cover page. She was also named by Forbes as African of the Year in 2020, and as one of the top most powerful women in the world for five years running. Dr. Ngozi received her PhD in Regional Economics and Development from MIT, and she is also the recipient of, I think, at least 17 honorary doctorate degrees, including from Yale University, the University of Pennsylvania, and Trinity College in Dublin. On the panel, Dr. Ngozi is joined by Ms. Trudy Makaya, who's the full-time economic advisor to the President of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa. In this role, Trudy provides technical support to the President on economic policy, including regular input on key issues and initiatives. Trudy holds an MBA and an MSc in Development Economics from Oxford University, and she is also a VITSI with a master's degree in economics from our university. Trudy has held various management, consulting, and corporate roles at Deloitte South Africa, Genesis Analytics, and Anglo Gold Ashanti. From 2010 to 2014, she worked as an economist and later a member of the Executive Committee of the Competition Commission, where she represented the Commission at various international fora, including the OECD and BRICS. Thereafter, she was CEO of Makaya Advisory, a consulting firm which she founded in 2015. She has also served as an advisor and investor in young companies and has held non-executive directorships, for example, at NTN South Africa. The other two members of the panel are colleagues from the School of Economics and Finance at WITS. The first is Dr. Kenneth Kremer, who holds, a master, who holds master's degrees in law from WITS and financial economics from SOAS at the University of London, and a PhD in economics from WITS. In October 2019, Kenneth was uh, appointed to South Africa's Presidential Economic Advisory Council. He also serves as the director of Crema Media, and he is a member of the management committee of the South African Student Solidarity Fund for Education. Kenneth has published widely on a range of policy issues, including fiscal policy, monetary policy, competition policy, labor market policy, and energy policy, as well as on open economy macroeconomics. 
And finally, Professor Libertine Hube is an associate professor in our school. He holds an MSc in economics from the University of York in the UK and a PhD in economics from UKZM. Like Kenneth, Liberty was appointed to the Presidential Economic Advisory Council in 2019. Liberty is also a former chief economist at the Competition Commission of South Africa, and he is now a part-time member of the Competition Tribunal. Liberty is an expert in the application of economics to competition law, and he has published widely on competition economics, industrial organization, and competition policy. We are very honored to have you all with us tonight. Thank you very much for making the time to celebrate the Witt Centenary with us. So we now have about 40 minutes, perhaps a little bit less, for a conversation between Dr. Ngozi and our other panelists on economic policy making in a highly unequal context. And as you would have seen from uh, Professor Piketty's address, South Africa would most certainly be described as a highly unequal context. In a very recent study conducted by the World Bank, South Africa was identified as having the highest rate of inequality among the 164 countries that were tracked in the study. Underlying this inequality is our stubbornly very high rate of unemployment. The most re recent measures are that almost 8 million working age adults in South Africa are unemployed and actively searching for work, while a further 3.5 million adults want employment but are not actively searching. And this means unemployment rates of 34% or 44%, depending on the definition. So Dr. Ngozi, if I may start with you, we have heard you say before that the WTO is all about people. In its founding charter, the purpose of the organization includes helping countries to create employment and increase living standards. So my question is, how do we ensure that global trade does not exacerbate, but rather reduces inequality both between and within countries? How do we ensure that global trade encourages the inclusion of poorer countries and the inclusion of poorer people within richer countries? Over to you. Well, thank you so much. And it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be with all of you. Um, I hope we won't have connectivity issues. I'm talking to you outside the meeting in Rotterdam. So let's see if it will hold up. And it's delightful to be with Trudy, with Kenneth and Liberty, uh, partners in crime when I was at the a part of the presidential uh, commission. Um, well, your question is a very weighty one. And I'll start by, by saying that, you know, trade tends to have a bad name. Uh, especially among young people, they don't see trade is almost synonymous with uh, to them with globalization, which they don't many do not see as a good thing. But I just want to remind before we uh, jump to that conclusion uh, that um, you know over the past decades, trade has been an instrument for lifting over a billion people out of poverty. It's worth remembering that in 1980, over 40% 40, 40 of the world population lived on less than $1.90 uh, a day. And just before the pandemic, this, this had gone down to 10%. And a lot of that was due to the effects of uh, bringing countries that were outside of the global trading system into it. Uh, admittedly, China is a shining example of, of a country that benefited the most from this. Trade has also been disinflationary by allowing the flow, manufacture and flow of goods, you know, from places where it was cheaper to be made to be imported into other uh, countries. So trade has had its benefits. So I just want to, to make clear that that's the case. That being said, it is undoubtedly true that there were people left behind. There were poor people in rich countries, as you said, and the poor countries who were left behind and not inside the mainstream. And as you said, when I came to the WTO, what, what made it interesting to me, this organization whose charter is uh, so wonderful, saying that you know it's about creating employment, enhancing living standards, supporting sustainable development. I mean, what could be better than that? It's all about people. 
So why is it that this is not delivering for people? Why can't we as Africa have benefited more from this uh, organization? And these were some of the questions I asked myself. How can trade become an instrument for inclusion? How do we take care of the opportunities? So this is one of the key issues and things that I'm looking for. Seeing how rules uh, for trade can involve micro, medium, and small enterprises, bringing those kinds of enterprises that are usually left out into the, into the global, into the national, regional, and global value chains, bringing women, uh, many of whom are those who own these kinds of enterprises into the, into the supply chains and value chains uh, globally. I think this is one way you can help create more employment, enhance incomes, and so on. So that is one of the things we've got to make uh, uh, trade do to see how we can mobilize it. Do we have rules that favor mediums, micro, medium, and small enterprises? The answer is no. We are now looking at how can we do that? Do we have systematically factor women's uh, 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 trading interests into global trading rules? The answer is no. We are now looking at how we can do that. Now, let me just add that I feel we're at a unique juncture in the world where there's actually an opportunity to use trade as an instrument for inclusion. You have seen what has become evident from the pandemic uh, and from the, this, the war in Ukraine. We've seen that supply chains are very concentrated and that the world is vulnerable. All the discussion now, including where I am here in Rotterdam at the Global Center for Adaptation is about diversification of supply chains. People are talking of things like French shoring, reshoring, nearshoring, but we are trying to encourage diversification. What does that mean? You should look beyond your friends and beyond yourself, because it's also risky to say, we are going to bring manufacturing uh, back home. We are going to bring supply chains home or to our friends in Europe. What about looking elsewhere to other countries where you know, the, the conditions are ripe? for you to relocate your supply chain. So we are actively talking to companies, developed countries to take a strategy of global diversification of value chains. That way they can bring, look at Africa. South Africa has the conditions, you have a high unemployment, but you do have you know, the, the, the uh, macroeconomic environment, maybe not as good as it used to be. But South Africa is capable of attracting some of these supply chains for pharmaceuticals and other industries. You already have some of them. Uh, there are other countries in Africa that are capable, Ghana, Senegal, Rwanda, and so on, my own country, Nigeria. We should think about how we do that. This is a way of including us, and I call it re-globalization. So let's not talk of de-globalization and fragmentation. Let's talk of re-globalization, using that as an instrument to bring those marginalized in. Let me leave it there for a moment. Thank you so much, Dr. Ngodi. If I could just push this a little bit further, uh, you've mentioned bringing supply chains to countries in Africa. So could I uh, question you about Africa specifically? Uh, you have pointed out frequently that African countries together contribute only a very small share to global trade. So could you elaborate further how trade could be used as a mechanism to benefit African countries and what would be the WTO's role in this? You started answering this, but perhaps you could elaborate a bit further for us. Thank you. Yes, you know, Africa contributes less than 3% of world merchandise trade, and that is tiny. And my ambitions, and I hope all ambitions for Africa is that we should be able to double this, you know, within the next decade. It's uh, far too small and slipping. But um, we find that over 50% of the goods we export, and, uh, you know, we, we export about uh, two, we have about 2.6% uh, of world exports, something around that. But more than 50% are, as you know, raw materials, commodities, there, there's no value added to them. We've been talking this talk for years and we're still where we are and the numbers don't look good, they're even worsening. So if we are to double, you know, Africa's share of world trade in of merchandise goods, how do we do it? If we are to trade more 
among ourselves because we have the African continental free trade area. And to me, the two go hand in hand. Our trade among ourselves is only about 15 to 16% of intra-Africa trade, but we are all selling a lot of us the same things. So we, we need to step back a little. We need to see how we add value. I don't think we can grab a bigger share of world trade without adding value to the products we have. And that's why first, and then attracting the manufacture of other products. So that is why I'm passionate about uh, supply chains. I see a big opportunity in pharmaceuticals because everybody's eyes have now opened to the fact that Africa cannot continue importing 99% of its vaccines and 95% of other medicines. And South Africa has started very well. You have Aspen, you have other you know, initiatives. And we now have a unique opportunity, not just about vaccines, but bringing in the supply chains on the continent. We can manufacture and export to ourselves and outside. And this is real. We've been actively working with the CEOs of these companies to see how we can encourage them. Uh, and we have other things we are monitoring at the WTO, export restrictions, which they are very interested in, which enables us to meet with them and discuss how they can do business and help and, and uh, relocate or re, re uh, diversify their supply chains in Africa, whilst also benefiting from some of the work and knowledge we do. So this is very, very practical. So we need to, but if we as Africans don't reach out actively, I can tell you there are other countries. I listened to a presentation from the Minister of Investment of Saudi Arabia a couple of days ago. And they've now crafted a total policy to seize advantage of this diversification, to attract companies to their country. So we should also uh, have the same approach on the continent to do that, attract com uh, companies who can help us add value to our products, who can help create employment for the numerous young people. Actually, if we don't do this, we will have social instability and it's already happening in many of our countries. So this is no joke. I mean, this is something we have to consciously pay attention. We have the capability, cocoa in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire and chocolates. I think both presidents and, and in both countries, they are now looking at this and saying, why are we exporting that and then buying chocolates from Switzerland and Belgium and so on. And adding value to that is creating job. Jobs. I'm just using that as an example. I could go on and on. There's so many value chains where we could do better than we do. So it's very practical. I'm not talking theory. Now, let me just mention one thing. There's a branch of the WTO called the ITC, the International Trade Center, um, which is 50% WTO owned, 50% UNCTAD owned. And they, their work is to really focus on SMEs and on women and try to help them you know, to penetrate external markets. Uh, so they help to, you know, there are a lot of sanitary and phytosanitary requirements. You have to meet certain standards to export. And I saw a delightful example in my own country that I hadn't been aware of that the ITC with the WTO is actually working with share butter producers in Nigeria who had been trying to break into world markets, but were banned from the US, banned from Europe because they didn't meet the standards. And over five or more years, they worked with them to upgrade the quality of their share butter. Now they, uh, they are exporting to the US. This is women, uh, groups of women cooperatives. They're exporting to Europe. They've more than doubled their incomes. I have a cream, I meant to show it to you, which says here's an, a cream made in Italy with Nigerian share butter. But we need to go one step further. We need to make that cream in Nigeria, not just export the share butter. Anyway, I'm going on too long, but you see that I'm very concrete. I don't like talking in the air, you know, about the things we need to do. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Ngozi. I would like us to, I mean, certainly the implications of trade for job growth are obviously very important in South Africa. And I would like us to further probe policy making in a highly unequal context by focusing more now on job growth in South Africa. So I'm going to now turn to Kenneth to ask Kenneth a, a question about job growth. 
Kenneth, from Nelson Mandela's State of the Nation Address in 1994 to recent comments by the Presidential Economic Advisory Council, the view of many policymakers in South Africa has been that the most effective way to reduce inequality and poverty is to create work opportunities for our people. Yet you have to concede that we have not been very successful in chipping away at a very high rate of unemployment. So given your ongoing work as an academic economist and as a policy advisor, what interventions do you think would be most effective for increasing employment in South Africa and are any related to increasing or diversifying South Africa's exports? Oh, thank you so much, Dori. Um, just before I get straight on to your question, I just think this is the most wonderful way to, to celebrate the Witt centenary, to talk about these big ideas. I mean, to talk about re-globalization, that's a wonderful idea and an antidote to people who are fragmenting the world and breaking it up. We need to have those kind of ideas. To talk about the possibility of having a more equal world, as uh, Toma was talking about, those are the big ideas that must guide us. And to be on this panel, I could go on as well for a long time. I mean, I think Dr. Ngozi is one of the bravest and most inspiring people that I've worked with. And also Trudy Liberty, we do our best to offer advice um, to the president on these matters. So uh, to answer your question, you know, there's two interesting stylized facts really about um, the South African employment crisis. The one is that when we have growth, if you look at the data, we do create jobs. But when we create jobs, unemployment often rises at the same time. So what does that tell us? It tells us that there is a strong correlation between growth and job creation, as you would expect. And when there's a crisis like COVID, when there's no growth, we see the, the, the number of jobs fell by one to two million in that time. But even in those times when we're creating jobs, when we have high growth, for example, in the early 2000s, we don't create enough jobs to, to absorb those that are coming into the labor market. You know, there's, there's young people coming into the labor market. There's disillusioned work seekers who are returning from time to time into the labor market. There are older people who are taking longer to leave the labor market, maybe. So the labor market is large and it continues to grow more quickly than the jobs that we are creating. So it's not that we have jobless growth, Dory. We don't have enough growth and we don't have enough jobs. You know, that's how we must characterize. So trade and sheer butter and chocolates and all of those things are relevant to that, to, uh, to create jobs. Um, I think in the particular circumstances of South Africa, the question is, well, why don't we have enough growth? And I would say that there are historical and current factors that, are, that cause that. Historically, the colonialism and apartheid have meant that our capital markets, our capital formation has been distorted, our infrastructure is distorted. If you look around the country, you can see that we, are, we haven't serviced people in, in, the, in the Bantustans, in the, in the black areas that don't have the same level of service delivery, health, education, access to security services. And capital formation itself was very much linked to mining and didn't diversify um, uh, as much as it could have. You know, we have got some diversification, but our industrial policy was stunted and, and shaped in a way that didn't create enough jobs. So that would be historical reasons. The current reasons I think we're aware of, you know, the current reasons you have vested interests that make it difficult to implement the policies that we need. For example, our energy transition. You know, we, we have a load shedding, we have a shortage of electricity, but vested interest in historical industries and, and such things make it so difficult to do the right thing and to implement the energy transition, the low carbon, the investment. We are making steady progress and Trudy knows a lot about that. I mean, it's a, it's a large part of the work that we do to try and unblock those, the, the, those vested interests. And the second current problem has been weak state capacity, corruption, stealing, really disappointing. You know, for those of us who were there when Mandela spoke in 94, we just assumed that the democratic state would be better than the apartheid state. We assumed it would serve people, but it didn't work out like that, you know, and it's really, it's part of our current problems. So to a short answer to your question, Dori, is that we need growth to get to create jobs and we need more growth to create jobs than what we have now. And we in particular need capital formation and infrastructure investment. And it's really important that we look at our fixed investment levels. You know, during the COVID, we fell down to 13% of GDP. Our investment in South Africa is at historic lows. And, if you, and we need to double that 
to create enough jobs to start to absorb the uh, to absorb the people in the labor market, people coming into the labor market. So, so the government needs to double its investment. The state-owned companies need to double their investment, and the private sector needs to double its investment. Of those three components, all double their investment. We can pick it up to twenty-five to thirty percent of GDP. That's my take. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, I think we could have a very big discussion about what kind of growth we need to increase employment. But I would like us, I want to continue this discussion by focusing on some of the constraints to, to job growth and to economic growth, which you have spoken about in part, and we'll come later to issues of, of corruption. But I wanted to, to turn to Trudy about and ask you about a characteristic of the labor market that has puzzled many economists, which is why are there so few people who are making work for themselves compared to the millions of South Africans who are unemployed or out of the labor market completely? For example, why are so few people starting very small businesses in the informal sector? So in light of your experience, both as an entrepreneur and as a policy advisor, what more do you think should be done to stimulate entrepreneurial activity in South Africa and micro entrepreneurial activity in particular? Do you think that this is something that would follow just from economic growth? Or do you think it's something that requires active interventions? And if so, what would these interventions be? Thanks, Trudy. Um, thank you so much, Dori, and it's also an honor to be uh, on this panel uh, with Ngozi, uh, whom I admire very much, and Kenneth and Liberty uh, partners in crime, <laughs> as Ngozi said. Um, so you're right, in the sense that if we look at comparative countries, um, you know, there was a statistic that uh, on average, for instance, the informal sector in countries such as ours is about um, creates about 30% of um, jobs, uh, whereas in South Africa, the informal sector creates only about 10% uh, of jobs. So that tells us that um, there's something uh, within uh, the South African economic landscape that has diverged uh, from other emerging markets, even not, not, never mind uh, converging to rich countries, but actually uh, the experience of other uh, poor and, and developing countries. I think some of it are the factors that Kenneth has touched into that are historical, where you know pushing people into Bantu stands, for instance, denying people education, those things make it very difficult uh, for then, uh, you know, for livelihoods uh, and and for sustainable uh, businesses to form in those townships and those Bantu stands, and we know this. Uh, we've had many discussions over a long time, for instance, about how to stimulate rural and township economies that are inherently placed far away from economic hubs. So I think history uh, explains some of that. Now, passing into um, the democratic era, we also find that a lot of our, our regulatory frameworks are geared towards corporates. Uh, and you can go through many uh, aspects uh, of, of regulation. If you look at zoning, uh, if you look at how we enforce bylaws in uh, municipalities, if you look at the uh, uh, regulations we have, for instance, for food, um, uh, for safety standards, you need safety standards, but you also need um, the kind uh, of enabling environment that could have a, a food culture, a hawker culture, a street food culture, uh, like in Asian countries, for instance. We don't do that. We really over-regulate uh, and have a lot of requirements that are really not appropriate for those uh, smaller businesses, which is why we've been working on red tape reduction which benefits all businesses. Uh, and a lot of corporates often are the ones who fight for red tape reduction. But if you look at some of the, 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 the measures that would be uh, loosened, some of the exemptions that you would have, it's smaller and informal businesses that would benefit. We saw recently, for instance, in the competition uh, space, and, and Liberty is an expert on that, uh, but we've seen an exemption for smaller businesses from certain kinds of competition regulation that in a sense go against what we often think of as competition regulation. So exemptions that would allow small businesses to collaborate, for instance, 
but they're too small really to change market outcomes or to have harmful cartel behavior. So allow them to do some of those things that increase their bargaining power. You know, uh, uh, Professor Piketty spoke earlier about enhancing bargaining power at the bottom. So I think those kinds of initiatives will deal with uh, what marginalizes uh, informal businesses. Then of course, the human capital element is also important. Our education system has, has not given people the basic education that they would need to have the numeracy and some of the um, technical skills that are not necessarily academic that allow people to become plumbers, that allow people to do low level um, um, coding, uh, those kinds of activities that you're starting to see as self-employment uh, activities in many uh, developing countries. India comes to mind, for instance, in terms of coding and people being able to uh, develop uh, uh, businesses from that at fairly lower uh, skills, uh, skills level, but still you need some basis for that. So I think a lot of the work that we need to do and improving the quality of basic education. And the point is often made that for us it's about uh, increase in improving governance of schools, improving uh, teacher training. It's not about the quantum of money that's been spent because as a proportion, we're already in line uh, with many other countries. It's more that we're not getting the outcomes uh, that we need to get. So I think there isn't one kind of thing that keeps uh, small businesses uh, marginalized, but it's a combination of factors. Um, the president, of course, is also very passionate about access to finance. And this really came to a head um, at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, where there was um, a, a credit guarantee scheme where government said we will advance some financial resources to allow the private banking sector to uh, lend money to, to small businesses. And once again, we saw the outcomes. Um, take up was quite low and take up was by the more established businesses. So it tells us that even our instruments to get those businesses funded are not necessarily appropriate. Uh, we're finding that some of the innovation actually tends to come from the non-bank uh, fintech type financial services, which then um, approaches the business where it is and doesn't impose requirements, doesn't look at collateral, but actually says, let's look at your cash flows and what you actually do uh, and then have uh, you, uh, and support you against that as opposed to trying to think of you as a corporate. So there are a lot of those kinds of innovations that we still need that would allow small businesses to be visible uh, and to be able to accumulate assets. So let me leave it at that. And of course, I've also maybe preempted a little bit also on the competition front where there are so many concentrated industries that it does become quite difficult for small businesses to, try, to thrive uh, under those contexts. Oh, thank you very much, Trudy. So you just provided me with a really nice introduction to something I wanted to ask Liberty and pick up also what you and what you spoke about and what Dr. Ngozi spoke about about supply um, and the possibility that market concentration inhibits the growth. So perhaps you could start by telling us what is there um, excessive market power of the what has been the competition policy response to this? Presumably this would be one area where you actually do want um, notwithstanding what Truth spoke about the new regulation. Um, thank you, Dori. Um, and uh, it's like the other colleagues, um, I'm actually, it's a great, it's, uh, it's a grateful of a chance to, to participate in today's discussion. I'm going to share part of my perspective, which is really based on my experience um, with, with you and, and, and the colleagues I've not seen in a long time, Dr. Ngozi, for instance. So if you, I think the starting point is to accept that South Africa has an excessive market power problem. And if you thought this was far removed from you, here are some of the facts. So if you're lucky and can afford, say, private healthcare, you'll face three hospital groups. If you are lucky and can afford air travel and you decide to you know, fly in whichever direction you like, you're gonna face two airlines. If you are lucky and you say like alcoholic drinks, one firm controls more than 40%. Uh, one firm controls more than 40% of the cigarette industry. 
if you like gambling, you've got a lot of disposable income, you're facing three or four groups. Um, and if you, you know, like to communicate with your family, with your friends and with your biz businesses, you're facing two firms. The other is, you know, on its deathbed. Um, to all of this, you know, I could go on and on and on, but the evidence is clear. So South Africa does have an excessive market power problem. Um, and to see this more practically, the competition authorities have uncovered anti-competitive practices you know, in many areas of physical and business necessity, such as maize meal, bread, milk, poultry, beer, wheat flour, healthcare, aluminium, steel, bricks, cement, ticketing services, industrial gases, insurance, coal, the list is long. And to, 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 to make things worse, as part of the, you know, the competition tribunals work on sustaining trust in markets, in the last two years, the tribunal has issued 48 orders in which firms have admitted to excessive market power and to excessive pricing um, in things like face masks, hand sanitizers, eggs, raw ginger, maize meal again. You, you know, I could go on and on. The, the, the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD, all have spoken about this market power problem, this concentration problem that South Africa has. Several other studies have also found that you have high concentration, which is also accompanied by high markups. So to the cases and the practical examples I've given, you've got this rich empirical side, but to the layman, you know, you just have to look at whatever you're buying, then you understand that you've got three or four firms that you're facing. Excessive market power itself increases the cost of goods and services for consumers, depresses wages, stunts in investment, blocks entrepreneurship, retards innovation, uh, but also concentrates economic power, you know, with monopolies and oligopolies who use that to win favor by, and also further entrench their dominance. At the same time, you know, profits flow disproportionately to the, to, to the rich in society, and even worse, the left out majority who are historically black people, uh, you know, face the other side of the coin. Um, they, are, they have the least ways of avoiding it. Um, and all of this makes worse the in income inequality, makes worse I I the inequality of economic opportunity. So th there have been two responses from a competition policy perspective. The first one has been to embed equality considerations into competition law. And the amendments in 2018 were part of this, but essentially, you promote competition, not, for, not, not as an end in itself, but because you, are, you also want to spread ownership, because you want to increase participation of small firms, black-owned firms. The second response where I actually have a passion for this, and in the tribunal, we spend a lot of time thinking about how the, the how part, the, the how competition you know, promotes equality. This response ignores that you know, the normative uh, uh, issues I've spoken about in terms of purpose and gets you know, to, to, to the underlying work. And the, the, the underlying hy hypothesis is a very simple one. An efficient competition policy supports greater market competitiveness, which in turn leads to economic inequality. To illustrate practically, when Pepsi wanted to buy Pioneer Foods two years ago, uh, Pioneer Foods, as we know, is one of the major agro-processing firms in South Africa. The competition tribunal stepped in and imposed conditions. And those conditions were, were key. They included a BEE ownership plan uh, and also uh, you know, about 1.6 billion was set up for a workers' trust, worker ownership. Piketty spoke about this. This is the, the, the next big thing on the, on the horizon for competition authorities. Last year, when ECP funds a, a US-based investment uh, fund proposed acquiring Beggar King. Uh, um, the tribunal stepped in again and imposed conditions. This after the commission had prohibited the merger because it was worried about it, you know, uh, an ownership issue, that the ownership would, black ownership would fall to zero from 68. And, and, and key amongst that was local procurement and a, a worker ownership program with 5% of workers being given uh, uh, shares in Beggar King. So, 
all of this just shows that the, the competition approach is not to see its effects as incidental byproducts, but rather as a path to societal change. Uh, let me stop here for now. Thank you so much, Liberty. So I think what the message you're telling us is that market there is strong market con uh, concentration in South Africa, and this is a large constraint on employment growth, um, helping, for example, to explain why so, so few people are engaged in uh, micro entrepreneurial activity. I would like us to move on to another set of constraints on job growth in South Africa. Um, and this concerns issues around trust and corruption. Dr. Ngozi and Trudy, if I can turn to you. Um, South Africa is often being described as suffering from a trust deficit, a lack of trust in institutions, both in the public and the private spheres. And underlying this lack of trust is the scourge of corruption, including what has been called state capture in South Africa. Dr. Ngozi, you have been at the forefront of fighting corruption, especially in your role as Nigeria's finance minister, often at great personal cost to yourself and your family, which you've outlined in your 2018 book, Fighting Corruption is Dangerous. How does one develop systems that safeguard against corruption? In other words, that prevent people who have access to public resources from using these resources for their own self-enrichment at the expense of society as a whole. What is your advice to us in South Africa on this particular issue? Well, thank you so much, Dori. It would be totally presumptuous of me to be giving advice to South Africa. So I won't even be so presumptuous. All I can do is kind of share some of the experiences uh, that we've had uh, at home and some of the way, ways we approached it. Before I do that, let me say that, you know, a lot of public corruption is, 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 is also linked to public procurement. And there are some astonishing figures. You know, the World Bank estimated that total global spending on public procurement in 2018, for instance, was $11 trillion globally from all governments. That's 12% of global GDP then. And about 10 to 20% of this was lost in corruption. So we are talking huge numbers. So one of the things to look at uh, in, in public procurement immediately is how to institutionalize transparent processes. Now, you know, uh, South Africa is quite sophisticated and I'm sure you've already done some of this, but for us, uh, we also looked at how do we set up a public procurement system uh, with fresh air, with lots of transparency uh, that would enable us to avoid, because we did find a lot of corruption was coming from public procurement. So that's one. What we did in introducing transparency and you know um, rules of the game uh, 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 that had to be followed at certain thresholds, was it 100% uh, successful in coming that? No, but it did introduce an element uh, of safeguard into the system so that people didn't have a free for all. Um, but let me tell you one thing that, that uh, has been quite helpful, at least in my time in fighting corruption, is technology. As Minister of Finance, I, I thought that, um, you know, I'll just give one example. When I took office, we, 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 I would get the payroll. Let's say the Ministry of Agriculture would come to me and say, we have X number of people on the payroll. They would send this in, and then we would pay against that. Um, a lot of things were manual. And through this process, you had introduced or entrenched into it corruption because then people could introduce ghost workers who became ghost pensioners. Um, and, and how do you deal with something like that? So just as an example, I stood back and with the, the economic team and the support of the president, of course, we thought about introducing uh, uh, government financial management systems based on technology so that we could take out as much of the manual and human intervention as, as possible. 
and uh, we we had a integrated payroll and personnel management system um, uh, that had uh, you know technology built in uh, so that everyone could be identified. Um, we we had uh, a government financial system that was based on you know technology that linked the the budget the treasury to the other departments so we didn't have all this manual stuff so again did that solve the entire problem the answer is no but it did solve a lot we were able to sell, sell uh, save one one about a billion 1.2 billion dollars by wiping out a lot of these ghost workers and ghost pensioners from the payroll there's still some of that it's not perfect but we did a lot so when you have stealing of state assets, um, we now have all sorts of technology that can be introduced to see what's actually happening, to be able to identify, you know, you have, uh, you know, I don't need to go into detail now, but we all know we have systems of cameras and drones and things that can be used to monitor what is going on. So what am I saying? I'm saying technology, think technology. It's not the perfect solution, but it can help in certain circumstances. Two, prosecution. South Africa knows that better than any other country. If you don't publicly, the system, the judicial system is not seen as acting on those who are found to be corrupt, then impunity will reign. So you actually have to have prosecutions that take, take place so people know they can't get away with it. Three, values. And that's where your trust comes in. At the end of the day, you know, we may have lost one or two generations, but you have to start somewhere to introduce values to rebuild trust. That's a long-term project. It's not going to solve today's problems, but I've just given you a hint. Uh, you know, what happened when myself and my family were at risk is finding corruption in our, in our system of oil marketing whereby the government to subsidize uh, petrol at the pump. We had oil marketers who brought in refined oil. We would sell crude, bring in refined because we can't refine all of our own oil. And in, in this paying, of sub, of, uh, paying back of subsidies to the oil marketers, we found we had spent $11 billion at one point, so much above what we should have been spending in the treasury. And so suggesting to the president, let's do an audit which he supported. Uh, this was in 20, 2013, 20, uh, sorry, 2012, 2013. We found $2.5 billion worth of fraud in $8 billion uh, of uh, spending on oil subsidies that we audited. And this was where the problem began because saying, no, we are not paying you led to uh, problems. There were people who claimed they brought oil in oil on a ship, but Lloyd's register knows where ships are in different parts of the world. So one, the ship was actually in China when they were saying it was in Nigeria. And so we had evidence that some of these things were not right. So there's no magic bullet. You need an array of policies, technologies. You need to be crystal clear and people need to know that fighting corruption starts with them. It starts with you. You have to take responsibility, not just waiting for government or some nebulous organization to fight it, but that demands courage. I'm not saying everyone should have it, but I'm just sharing with you a few stories. Thank you so much, Dr. Ngozi. I, I hear the, um, your voice from other interviews where you've spoken about the importance of incremental achievements in building trust. So I wonder, Trudy, we don't have very much time left, but if you could possibly just in a very few minutes, if you wanted to add to this, given your extensive experience, both in the public and private se uh, sectors, what have you learned about what we can do to rebuild trust in our institutions? And I would think by implication, make our institutions more trustworthy. It's a very big question. So I'm asking you for a two minute response which is very difficult <laughs> thank you i will try so i think the one thing that has been um highlighted in, in various uh instances in the south african case was also the culpability of the private sector uh and the role that it played uh in terms of of, of the corruption and we see a lot of the companies um slowly coming to their reckoning but i think if we're going to rebuild trust um 
I would suggest that some of them, or probably all of them, probably have a lot more to do uh, in terms of reparatory action um, um, to, to, to show um, in ways um, that, are, that go beyond what the state is doing, um, um, that they have turned a corner and understand the economic harm that has been done. Because it's not just the harm of taking resources, but as many of my colleagues would say, also the harm in breaking down those institutions like the Revenue Authority, for instance. On the part of the state, I think Gozi has already touched on it, prosecutions. Um, you know, we, we, we've heard from the security cluster, we've seen arrests uh, gaining pace. Uh, we've heard from the cluster that more is coming and that there's more concerted effort to hold people accountable, uh, particularly those who are decision makers in the state uh, for, for the corruption that they've done. I agree with the point around technology. I think one thing from, from our South African experience was that you know, a lot of the systems are there. Uh, and you know, if you look from everything to the PFMA, now what's been done with procurement reforms and, and had started for some time, the system are in place. The challenge was that a lot of the action was then taken out of the state uh, and, 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 and you know, through nefarious ways was happening elsewhere. So it also boils down to the will of the people to optimize on those systems that exist uh, and make sure that they follow due process and they follow uh, processes um, as, as, as they prescribed and, and not to have parallel and all kind of um, um, taking things outside of the state and, 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 and siphoning money off that way. I think finally on the flip side of it all, is that we do have a demoralized public sector. Uh, we do have people who, who sometimes err on the other side or the good people then turn to err on overcompliance, being afraid to take risks, being afraid to be innovative. And I think so we also have to be careful to strike the balance of saying we need transparency, we need due process. At the same time, the ordinary official shouldn't feel as if they're not empowered to take decisions, empowered to make genuine mistakes. Uh, which are not uh, related to corruption. But as I say, um, there's work done to ensure that accountability uh, is embedded, that the work comes back into proper institutions. The other element, just quickly of the trust equation though, I find is also around, it is more cognitive and more around people's ideas about what drives economic growth. And I think for a long time, business, uh, labor, government, have very different ideas and we, we're trying to find mechanisms to reconcile those ideas. Uh, but I think this talking past one another and um, having this ideological disjunction where we're not willing to make certain kinds of trade-offs is another source of trust, which hopefully uh, some of the processes like the social compact um, should be able to resolve. Can I just add one thing, Dori, just super quick. I Please. think something Trudy said set me off. We must always remember in, in fighting corruption that 99% of our people are honest, hardworking people, uh, you know, who, who are, want to go about their business and are not there stealing or diverting money. That used to really drive me, knowing that 99.9% .9 of people in my country are honest, hardworking, entrepreneurial. And if you have point something percent, that are diverting these resources. That gives you the strength because it's not the majority of people to hold them accountable. Thank you, Dr. Ngozi. And I think we will have to have that as our final word. I think we could spend a very long while yet debating all these questions. And there were so many other questions that I wanted to ask, but we don't have time. We're we are now out of our allotted time. Thank you very much to our panelists, Dr. Ngozi, Trudy, Kenneth, and Liberty for this conversation. It really has been a privilege to have this discussion with you. And I'm now going to hand the virtual microphone back to Daniela. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dory, and thank you to each of our panelists. Um, it's been the most remarkable evening. I wish we had more time. If we had another week, we wouldn't have been able to get through all the interesting questions and comments that have come through on our Q&A. Um, but there never is enough time. Um, and unfortunately, we have to draw the event to a close. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Professor Jason Cohen to have the final say. Um, Jason is our current Dean of the Faculty of Commerce, Law and Management. 
He's also a professor of information systems in the school, uh, in the faculty rather. Um, he is a long-standing member of staff at WITS and also a proud WITS alumnus. Um, from my side then, it's thank you all very much and good night and over to Jason. Thank you so much, Daniela. I'm so sorry we're out of time, um, but it's my privilege though as the Acting Dean to close this event tonight with a vote of thanks. Thank you, Professor Kalam Prumble, for hosting us this evening. Um, and Daniela, Professor Kasali, thanks for chairing the proceedings and running such an effective event. I also want to thank the speakers, of course. I know Professor Piketty had to leave, but what a pleasure to have him return to WITS, albeit virtually agreeing to keynote tonight's event and sharing his research and perspectives with us. Dr. Ngozi, such an honor. Ms. Makaya, thank you both for joining the panel and contributing to such an enlightening evening. My other of its colleagues and organizers, Dory, Kenneth, Liberty, thank you for your inputs and together with Daniela, conceptualizing such an inspiring event and bringing it to life with such rich interactions. Uh, Rachel and Mimosa, thank you for making this happen. We forget the huge amount of work that goes on behind the scenes to make events like this run smoothly. And we should always applaud all of those who have put in the hard work to ensure we have the platforms for such um, stimulating discussions. We also need to acknowledge the conversation, our media partner. We take great pride in our relationship with you and the role you play in supporting public debate informed by research, so thank you. And I also want to recognize Professor um, Imran Velodia, who had the foresight to establish the Southern Center for Inequality Studies in 2017. Um, the center is now flourishing and it's doing excellent research in a variety of areas related to inequality. Um, and it's significant that this, that this event has taken place in the university's centenary year and fitting that the school chose the problem of inequality as its centenary highlight. And we celebrate the university's past 100 years. We're also obviously thinking about our role as a public institution going forward. And although we're committed to being a center of research excellence, attracting high level academics, building our postgraduate student numbers and our research, we of course have to remain a public institution. And part of our history has always been about responding to the needs of our community and broader society. And these conversations and the research being done in the school and the inequality center hold the promise of positively affecting policy in ways that make a fundamental difference not just to the lives of people today, but to future generations. And so this work really has the potential to form part of the very best of what WITS aspires to be. So thank you to the school for hosting us. Um, thank you for such an important and valuable discussion. And thanks to all of you for joining us here tonight. Have a wonderful evening and good night. Good night all. Uh, thanks. <clears throat>